Okay, so let's get started. Good evening, folks. My name is Nikki Oxel, and I'm Head of Research at Pasture for Life and delighted to be joined this evening by Dewi Jones from Innovis. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing hearing more about this. And we quite often get asked for more sheep related uh, webinars. Um, and I will admit that the, the lack of sheep related webinars is my fault, as I'm definitely more of a cattle person. <laughs> so it's really, really good to have uh, more of a sheep focus this evening. Um, and yeah, it was great, great that we are able to to partner with Innovis on on this webinar. I was lucky enough um, last year to actually visit the Southfields farm and to hear more about what Innovis were doing. Um, and so really, really interested to, to be able to share that with you this evening. Um, very briefly to introduce Derry, um, originally from a family farm on the Flynn Peninsula in North Wales, um, and has spent time in New Zealand, as well as then returning to, uh, to Wales to lead um, sheep research projects uh, at IRS, and um, later on then established Innovis and has been working um, in that uh, with the business and leading that business for uh, a number of years now um, but we'll hear more about that in a second so um, just a little bit of housekeeping please make sure you're all on mute because um, we are running this as a meeting style rather than a webinar if you unmute I will probably just jump in and mute you to make sure that we keep um, the sound uh, as it should be and um, also just to say that if you have questions, um, pop you can either pop them into the chat or you can just hold on to them. And towards the end of the, well, at the end of the presentation, um, we'll be able to open up for questions and you can unmute and ask your question at that point. So I'm going to hand over now to Dewi and um, yeah, look forward to, to hearing what you've got to share with us. Thank you, Nikki. I'm just gonna put a share screen up if that's okay. Can you see that everybody? Yep, that's grand. There we go. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's it's great to be able to, to speak to you and hopefully we can align a little bit of the sheep talk tonight, um, catch up with Nikki's um, cattle stuff. So yeah, Dewey Jones, um, some of the names that were coming into the to the holding room there, I, I know quite a few of you and I'm sure some of you will know me, but it's very much tonight uh, a, an introduction to what we do, the logic really behind what we do. Um, and I would caveat everything I'm going to say by by stating that this is very much work in progress with Innovis. We've been breeding our own sheep now for 20 odd years, so it's very, very short in the scheme of things, and we are still very much learning as we go on. So um, bear with me. There are no wrong or silly questions, so feel free to plow in with those questions, and I'm sure Nikki will um, put them up at some point through the evening so we can answer them. Or we try and answer them at least. So yes, so the title breeding and selecting sheep for forage based systems. Um, and it is very much that. And we'll start really by by celebrating, I suppose, that there's so many of you that are actually committed to using the green stuff or the brown stuff this time of year. But certainly, you know, our ability to use forage has to be crucial. And we decided this Back when we started our genetics business, um, we have an artificial breeding business. Um, it was a we, we owned it fully. We now own part of that. And part of the reason we started breeding our own genetics in the UK was purely from a frustration that our industry just wasn't embracing what we felt were the really important things um, going forward. So we, we started this in 2007. Um, the, the business in 2002, but the cheap genetics part in 2007. And we did that with a blank piece of paper. And that's quite rare because most of the time we inherit um, beliefs, we inherit tradition, um, but we weren't going to have any of that. And I suppose I'd spent quite a lot of time um, both studying New Zealand, back into New Zealand on an official scholarship, and had lots of, of, of relationships that were very involved in changing how New Zealand sheep farming or breeding had 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 taken off. So those models were very much um, into our domain here in the UK. So our objectives from 2007 really was to breed rams. Again, accepting that rams is the mechanism to spread genetics in the UK. We can't use AI in sheep sensibly. Um, it's a laparoscopic procedure. 
um, doesn't lend itself really for a welfare point of view or, or justification for commercial farming, but certainly for the pedigree sector, it still does. So the RAM is our mechanism of getting genetics out there. And obviously some of you will be trading sheep, but I would hope that most would be breeding their own. Or certainly if you are trading, you're, you're taking biosecurity very seriously. Um, and we knew that we had to get sheep that could perform on forage in the UK. And it wasn't difficult to work that out. You know, people were paying 30 pence a kilo dry matter for concentrates, costing 20, 25 pence for silage, even more these days. Um, and we could get that lovely green stuff growing in the fields for not much more than five or six pence um, a kilo. And if we store that through the winter in a deferred grazing way, like Nikki and a lot of people do, then we can really cut our costs and really help the environment. Now, Back in those days, we didn't think so much about the environment. It was very much about production efficiency. Obviously, since then, the whole environmental debate and the need for looking after our soils has come to the fore, and rightly so, really. And we found very much with that in mind. So um, hopefully we're on the same page as most of you in terms of how we go about our farming um, here. I suppose the only difference is that we use performance records um, for specific traits that will hopefully make a difference and leave some sort of profit margin or sustainable business for the people using the genetics. Yeah, so, so we're very much evidence um, based in terms of what we do. And I'll explain a little bit of that as we go on through the talk. Now, I've mentioned um, efficiency at farm level and, and production efficiency. Um, obviously, the win-win for us currently is that production efficiency actually goes hand in glove with environmental benefit in most cases. So things like more productive views that can actually live longer, less lamb deaths, all of the things that are fundamental to make money from in a sheep enterprise are also the things that have a good environmental benefit. So that was an unexpected sort of win, but we are very much focused on that. And obviously starting to think and talk now more about that element of our breeding, the green sort of selection, if you like, you know, creating these this um, this in, this climate smart genetic approach, um, which is sort of being talked about in cattle, very much into the sheep sector within all of this. So, um, our aim to get sheep that thrive off grass and forage with little bought in feed. Now, if we need feed, we know that sheep have to be in the right body condition at certain times of the year to get maximum or to get optimum performance from them. So again, you know, not feeding sheep um, when you haven't got grass or the right forage would be just false economy. So we always work on the, on the principle. We always go for the more efficient grass-based systems first, and then we integrate into that um, um, supplement as and when we need them really. And a key component of what we've always done from the beginning is we've measured our sheep in the environment that their progeny have to perform in. So in other words, sheep and lambed, you know, we don't have flocks of 20 ewes um, that get regular petting. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. In fact, it's quite nice for children to grow up with them. Um, but we have large flocks that enable themselves to compete, which enables then traits to be pulled through um, under that sort of selection pressure. So very much in an environment that their progeny um, need to perform in and very much in a, in a large scale approach that enables sheep to express themselves when they're under grazing pressure. And that's quite an important one really in terms of the systems that are evolving with us these days in all of this. And obviously all of us these days have to have an eye on whatever we do with whatever ruminant or anything else that, that we're actually contributing positively to the environment and that we're creating a sustainable sort of system. And that's again, you know, part and parcel of, of our mantra really with all of this. And I suppose the relevance of that starts with our own in-hand farming operation. And Nikki referred to the fact that we do have a farm in, in the borders in, in um, just outside Hoik, it's called Southfield. And that farm has been on a journey. We've, we've only been in that place since September, 2020. Um, and I'll just show you just a few little slides or elements that we've got going on there that, that effectively shows um, 
the sort of challenges we put these sheep under and we ask them to perform it. And you'll see on the bottom right hand side there, we do have social media, um, quite a bit of social media um, presence on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. So by all means, if you've got time, um, log into those and you'll see some posts with us sometimes showing some of the things that we've actually got going on. Um, the farm up there is a 630 acre farm, a, a tenanted farm from Buclew Estate. Um, we did have a farm in Wales. We just couldn't make it work commercially here because the rents were too high. So we moved up uh, into Scotland, as I said, in September 20. And of course, that needed then uh, the usual approach that we take when we look at land and a resource to use the best from that farm. So um, what you see on the screen now is effectively the, the farm. Not all of it. There's another block here that hasn't been mapped fully yet. These are all zoned. Um, so we've known the soil types. Um, and obviously we nutrient manage the farm. Um, if I told you that this, this color, this particular view is of, of pH, um, anything red is under five, which the main hill or sort of upland rough block is. Um, when we came there in September 20, the majority of this farm was a nice shade of pink or red. So it was very much pHs were playing just below the five in there. And obviously that's one of the fundamental things we would embrace because we know that we need that really in terms of getting the soil nutrients and the microbes working properly. So although this is a sheep talk, um, you will have to bear with me just a little bit on the element of, of farming because we farm um, the land that then runs the sheep within all of this. And we take a very careful approach, no different to how we found to how we breed really. We look at what's going on in our soils and some of these are new from since you were there last Nikki, where we've actually analyzed now right through that rough grazing block as well. And you'll see some of this, this is showing um, a very low pH on that hill block as opposed to some of the, the ground that's now moved up because we've applied over a thousand tons of lime on that farm. Um, and you'll see also um, the, re the nice elements in here in that hill block is that some very nice um, organic matters already there. And there's a lot of the nutrient elements that are actually really good. Um, so this uh, set of results, um, some Solvita results that we did. And again, there's obviously much better informed people about the soil health elements in here, but we nutrient manage that farm to field and sometimes to zone within the field. And this is a, a sheep with some beef operation. But again, I would rather spend a little bit of money on analysis and actually nutrient manage it properly with the right elements to get the soil working than actually spending lots on artificial fertilizer and all of the inputs historically that people have used. So we very much work um, on that sort of approach. And then obviously for utilization on the farm, because it, it, it was very large paddocks, um, we've done lots of work on putting a proper water system in place because the other element in all of this is if we grow um, the forages or we improve elements of the farm, um, then obviously we also need to be able to have animals um, being kept in the right place. And that's my pet hate is no fences and gates and animals trampling everywhere so that we can rest. And <laughs> the crucial part, I'm sure, which most of we will know, is that those rest periods are actually probably more important than the grazing periods um, in all of this. And lots of subdivision gone on up there. Um, lots of work in terms of breaking the farm down into 3.7 hectare blocks so that we can actually um, work through insensible elements through the time of year. We get away not feeding concentrates on the farm other than uh, supplementation if we need to just pre-lambing because we haven't got enough grass covers. Um, but generally speaking, we work on, on very much forage-based systems. We grow winter crops there. Um, one of the lessons we have learned is to put more species in together. Um, last time we had a, a farm walk up there, things were looking pretty sparse because we'd had a drought <laughs> and our kale and our swedes were at the perfect height for the flea beetles to be munching away. But thankfully, um, we managed to get them past that point. But yeah, we're continually learning in terms of of actually um, mitigating that. And we're also mitigating now with liquid digestate from the AD plant up in Bow Hill, um, which seems to have quite a nice impact on the flea beetles, just pre-emergence um, to give us a bit of protection. So again, yeah, still learning in elements of that, obviously. And um, this farm lends itself for planting. So we've got quite a lot of trees going in currently. 
um, so the planting just starts now, but in very strategically placed blocks, so not, not in random places, or to create subdivision and shelter and also enhance, obviously, the, the, the environment and where they're going. Um, so I think there's about 270,000 trees going in currently, um, and that will be an ongoing programme with us, working with Tweet Forum, which are a brilliant group of, of individuals to work with up there, and we're very fortunate to have their expertise at hand, really. Now, I have put one slide in here on why does Innovis use composites or crossbreeding? Because, sorry, that's obviously wanting to run ahead. Um, and the reason for this really is that we started breeding with as many breeds as we could to try and move things as quickly as we could. So we are not at all against, you know, having the 90 odd breeds in the UK. In fact, we think the biodiversity is brilliant. And if you can actually add value to that by actually selling, you know, Herdwick or Swale or, or branded products or wool, then it's a phenomenal um, resource to be able to go direct to consumers. But generally speaking, we needed to try and get the matrix working that for every animal that was on a farm that had four legs and wool, or sometimes without wool, as we're breeding some of those as well, then we needed those animals to be as effective as possible in terms of what they were doing. And the reason we went for composite breeding is that it just meant we could get there much, much quicker. So instead of trying to work within a breed to actually try and improve those elements, then we would cross elements together within it. So an example of that would be um, a maternal ram, a blue face Leicester, mixed in with some maternal texels um, to create one of our product lines and then stabilized and bred on its performance and always open to putting other elements in there. So one of the New Zealand breeds we have was also incorporated into that maternal one not too long ago to actually improve prolificacy in it. So very much that element. And obviously the other one with all of that is that it does give us the, the ability to be quite autonomous when it comes to, to making decisions. Um, and um, we are, we have got a Chiviot line or two Chiviot lines actually in North Country and a South Country type. We are trying to keep those pure because we think that there is a, a requirement for that. Um, but it just reminds me about the requirements of having to work within breed societies. But we will embrace that and we will have um, the chiviots being kept as pure breeds um, without too much mixing into those to try and keep them um, uh, an attractive proposition for people. In terms of how our, our population works, um, Southfield, which is the farm I just showed you, that's in Hoik, that's got 1,100 ewes on it currently and about 350 replacements coming through. Um, and then we have another 10,000 ewes uh, spread across um, the country, all the way from the north um, of Inverness in, with John Scott up in Tain, and all the way down to probably David Rossiter, who's our most southern flock um, just outside um, Torquay. So very much um, all of these farmers are, are commercial farmers, forage-based systems. Um, and we do do, so we have done some interviews webinars and you'll see there's pictures of three of them in the bottom there. They did some webinars with us last week and they are available on the Innovis, um, uh YouTube channel. If you did want to have a look at, at what the breeders have to say to, to see their approach to everything, then um, th that is there for you to have a look at. But these 20, odd breeding partners give us a phenomenal ability to have a diversity of environments. The common thread in them all is that they're very commercial focused farmers. They're all forage based predominantly, very different systems. Um, some of them in Carmarthenshire, for example, Ben Anthony, who is the one on the right in the bottom there, has a much stronger farm down in Carmarthenshire compared to, um, for example, Jim Strummond in Annick. Um, so lots of different systems in terms of how they're working, but we evaluate, we have linkages across all of those flocks with, with common animals. All of our sheep are evaluated um, and we pull the differences out then based on um, the sort of the, the, the quite snazzy systems that we have these days um, within all of that. So quite a big population and growing, and that gives us the ability to actually select and, and use some quite strong data sets um, with all of that. We do our in-house genetic valuations, which tends to, to sort of raise an eyebrow sometimes for people, and um, why we're not using the, the national um, signet approach over here. And 
quite simply, historically, because the composites we were bringing were very difficult um, for Signet at the time to deal with, then it was easier for us to do it ourselves. And also, we are continually pulling new traits through the system, which again is quite a bind um, for a national organization in terms of, of that. But we are, we work very, very closely with Signet, um, with Sam and his team. Innovis provides all the uh, muscle and back fat scanning services through England and Wales for Signet. We work with them very closely on the Hill Ram scheme in Wales, and we do lots of, of research work with AHDV and Signet. Um, so um, although we do our own evaluations, it's very much um, using, if you like, the, the, the sort of the common approaches to it all and within all of this. I suppose the only main difference is that the last point I've got there is that Innovis operates a, a five-year rolling average. So instead of having a benchmark of performance, let's say, for example, 15 years ago, which some of the, the, the breeds that were performance recording had, um, we add this year's data into the population and we take year six out. So that at any one time, people looking at the breeding values of their animals will be looking at a live population of sheep about a five year span that's operating in the industry. So that means that when you look at any of its breeding values, they'll never be very high. You won't get growth rates, for example, in our terminal sires that are 14 or 15 kilos above the average for a certain time. Um, they'll probably be closer to four or five or six because the average is increasing effectively every year. And we're comparing to that average, which is increasing um, within all of that. And when people ask me, you know, in how can we make sure that all of this is is um, is transparent and fair and we're not trying to uh, pull the wool off over anybody's eyes? Quite simply, our, our objective is to have customers using the genetics and for those genetics to make a difference on their farm. So it would be very short lived if we were trying to do something silly because we're very close to our customers. We want feedback from them, the good and the bad. Um, and we pride ourselves in having an impact on farm with people. So, um, and we also have some internal mechanisms. We have a, a, a genetics team run by Janet Roden and Kim Hay that actually are separate to the sales team. So um, what Janet and Kim report goes as opposed to some um, manipulation that could happen, I suppose. Lots of traits are recorded within our breeding program. Now you could say, well, you don't need all of those traits. You could have a shepherd's handbook and, and an ear notcher, and it would do something um, equally good. And probably that's true. People that are out there recording for very commercial traits that would have their focus and understand and know their use and their flock will be able to do lots of this just by writing down what's going on. Um, we do tend to try and put some objectivity through some of that. So in other words, some of our functional traits like DAG scores, uh, fecal egg counts to create sheep that will actually need less treatment. Um, all of those elements do need objective measurements taking through them. And it's quite amazing when we ask farmers even very simple questions about what's the, the weight of your ewe flock pre-tupping. There's still quite a lot of people not quite sure what their weights are because they just haven't got that wherewithal to actually weigh those sheep to understand what the pre-tupping weights are to see can they increase the size of the ewe or hopefully decrease it and what the implication of that is. Even to the extent sometimes when we ask uh, customers or people what is the age profile in your flock, how many ewe lambs are coming in, people will have that answer. When we then ask the question well how many two, three, four, five year olds have you got in the flock, it becomes a little bit um, fuzzier. And we just know that there's lots of data and information we can get back from that by knowing that, you know, if you've probably got a very low number of four or five year old ewes, there's either some genetic issue in terms of what's going on in terms of selection, or there could be a disease like Yoni's munching away at the flock and they're just not quite sure what's going on with it. So having those data points is really quite important, both in terms of commercial um, production, but also when we start breeding. Because if somebody asks us what our genetic gain is on certain traits, I need our genetics team to be able to tell people exactly what that is. Um, you will see some elements in there. There's, there's one there that's tail length. Um, and again, we're breeding towards actually not docking our sheep because most of our, our sheep lamb outdoors. And we think that with the increasing pressure that's going on out there, then the, the, the use of hot irons 
um, when lambs are older, which will be quite a challenge for some of the hill flocks, is likely to, to come under scrutiny. So having long tails and having the ability to actually not have to crutch and, and not have to dock is going to be quite an important element in the future. But with all of these things, when we record a trait, we record all the other traits as well. Because quite often, if we select on one pathway for one trait, we will see consequences in others. So it's a very, very dangerous um, exercise to go specifically on one trait without actually understanding what's happening around that animal um, with the other impacts and really to avoid, you know, these, these, um, these other consequences that are detrimental to the overall picture of what's going on. So some of this data capture is quite painstaking. So that'll be used lambs at about four weeks of age coming in for DNA uh, profiling to do parentage assignment in, in one of the flocks. Um, and then this is foot scoring. So every foot scored um, for health structure and that fed in um, to the system um, to actually create a breeding value for foot structure. The other one there quite simply at the bottom there, some of you might have seen this already, zero to four is DAGs. So in other words, at that time of those ewes are being done and the ewes are being crutched in this instance, but what's happening is they're being dags scored before they're being crutched to actually understand which animals, which lines actually needed that dagging, which had clear breaches that didn't need it. So again, quite important to actually understand that. We start that recording um, when lambs are muscle and back fat scanned in our program, normally about 16 weeks. So the lambs are done then, and then the ewes in the, in the breeding flock in the nucleus are done every year um, about May time, um, just to see what, what's going on and to actually be able to breed, you know, cleaner sheep within all of that. Now, one of the questions that's quite often asked is, is you know, how do we make sure that all of this data is, is accurate and, and that it's robust? Because, you know, the disbelievers out there will say, well, you can manipulate data and performance records just like everything else. And I suppose that the crucial thing in, in this is that our breeding panels are believers. They understand what we're trying to do, which is to select animals that will reduce the workload for the customer, that will improve their efficiency, and that will actually help the bottom line. And every single one of our breeding partners wouldn't do anything that would actually compromise that. But that in itself isn't really enough. So we have a team of technicians um, run by Ross, who you'll see scanning there under the gazebo, um, that make sure that a lot of that data is standardized by them going out to collect it. And we do lots of of data submission checking, lots of data quality reports to the breeding partners, and it becomes quite a competition, really, of who's actually the best recorder out there in terms of our breeding partners. Um, everything we do, we use the ID for, um, never scribe, and you'll see the top right hand there, you'll see some tissue samples. In this particular instance, is it's lambs being DNA sampled for um, parentage. We also um, do that when we verify some of these animals for certain traits as well within all of that. Um, so lots of, lots of tech being used um, in all of that. And we've got very proficient technicians that can actually use um, two test equipment very, very efficiently where they will actually format um, what needs to be recorded. They'll upload those then through CSV files and we'll, we'll manipulate um, to make life much, much easier. And because we work with Focus Genetics in New Zealand, uh, which is Palmu Land Corp, um, we do send quite a lot of our staff across so that there's exposure. So we've got two technicians over there currently. Um, one is due to come back, hopefully today, actually, if she hasn't found a bow and has decided to settle there, but hopefully she'll be back. Um, so yeah, we send quite a lot of our techs over there so that they get embroiled in um, some of the New Zealand systems with focus who are obviously the biggest breeders in New Zealand um, in terms of land cup and palm and what they do um, in there. Just in terms of breeding values, because I think there's sometimes a bit of a, of a complexity of what are these fungal things. And quite simply, we, we take an individual record um, of an animal, um, be that a weight, which is a simple one, or lots of different records. So that's the individual's record. We have to understand who's, who's mum and dad and, and sisters and brothers and grandma and great granddaughters and all that, because that's what we need really to actually run these elements. And then obviously we need to understand, is that sheep running on a very nice farm in Carmarthenshire or in Pembrokeshire or in 
the highlands of Scotland, um, what is that environmental component within all of that? And our approaches take that into account. Um, so for example, I'll use Laming Ease or, or, or Dystopia as a good example. Um, if on one of the farms down south, that's kinder in terms of climate, um, we're not seeing too much segregation in particular lines or sires being used. As soon as some of those genetics are being used in Southfield, for example, um, it will quickly pull out if there's issues with some of them. And that information feeds back into the whole uh, element in terms of the breeding value for that animal. Um, because we use BLUP, um, best linear and bias predictor to try and even all those out. But despite saying all of that, um, our farmers buy their rams or buy the genetics based on the outcomes they want. So we always warn about getting too much into the depths of the points of, of the breeding values. Ultimately, we ask farmers to understand what their breeding objectives want to be for their flock, their commercial flock. And then we try and marry that back then to the kind of ram that will do what they need or that we will tweak the genetics for that to happen. And that can obviously work in all breeds, not just the innovous ones, um, in our ability to do that. But to do that, we need objective data um, to make those calls. So we have about 2,000 customers in the UK, up and down the country. Um, we have uh, just over 200 new customers coming in every year buying genetics. And obviously that's, um, that works um, for people, otherwise they wouldn't be buying year on year out. In terms of the type of genetic progress that we, we see, um, this is our other field line. So again, this is the blue face type. You see them on the top right there. Um, you see how the, the progressing index in this instance is a combination of all the traits together weighted to specific, um, to specific economic weightings. And we use that index as the selection tool really for the sheep as opposed to individual breeding values. So you'll see that index is increasing every year. Um, and then separately that within the population, you'll see that, that we've got things like growth of muscle going up, lambing percentage going up. And those are actual physical things we see in the Aberfield population, um, which is, is across about seven different farms. Um, and you'll see in there as well, a, a reduction in new weight. And that's really quite important. Um, and when we look at that from a, from a financial point of view, because sheep improve every year, the average goes up every year. If we take 2019 and we take the average ram, when we look at the top sort of five or percent rams now, in, in 2023 that are being offered, that's the kind of impact they will give um, in their daughter's performance um, through that period. So, so when you buy that RAM, it's actually moved on substantially from where it was in 2019. And, and I can't stress enough the importance of asking breeders, it doesn't have to be innovative, whoever the, your, your genetic provider is, what is their genetic gain in the traits that you need to see within your flock? because their job really is to improve the genetics that you're actually using so that you will benefit. That's really why you pay money for those rams. And the clever breeders out there will be very, very happy to engage with you in this and will not just tell you what their progress is, they will also tell you which animals from their population will give you the best results to fix a gap you might have or to actually push your your sort of your, your, your performance slightly better again within all of that. So that relationship, we always advise choose your breeder. Once you've done that and you're comfortable, let he or she actually help you choose the sheep from that flock then. The individual animal becomes much less of a choice compared to actually you believing and trusting the breeder um, with all of that. Now, obviously, there's quite a, an important environmental component to all of this. And I told you that the Aberfield yield, so this is the index of our Aberfield sheep in terms of going up year on year. But you'll see we've actually held the weight of the ewe down so that it doesn't become too heavy in, in what it's doing um, as a mature ewe. And we know that anything over that 65, 70 kilo mark in an upland or lowland situation is ineffective in terms of what you're doing. If you're, if you're pushing a 20, 21 kilo carcass into the marketplace, um, 
then really you do not need a bigger you because you will eat about two and a half percent of a body weight every day of the year. That'll become less just before lambing and it'll become much more after lambing. But on average, it'll be two and a half percent. And whatever that body weight is, is what she will eat. So obviously, if you've got an 80, 90 kilo you, then she will eat substantially more than um, your 65 kilo you. If you've got a native breed or a, or a hill breed that's obviously running on, on you know, deferred pastures or, or re proper regen um, pastures, then obviously some of those ewes will be much smaller. But again, equally important in that instance is making sure that that ewe's productivity justifies her being there. Because although she's sequestering and working there, she still needs to produce food. Um, and that's quite an important component really that we mustn't forget um, in all of this is that there is a happy medium somewhere with all of this in terms of, of how we balance, I think, the environmental benefit and also our food production, um, if we can get people to obviously accept some of the debates that we have with them. Um, equally important is the usability to hold condition because we need our sheep to be able to not just live, but they also need to perform on forage. And we do lots of condition scoring in our flocks, um, lots of mature weights, annual weights, and we've got a breeding value for condition score that is really quite important for us because it enables us to breed sheep that will hold their flesh um, through the, the production cycle um, and they will recover quickly if they need to as well. And obviously this is where some of the native breeds really have you know, some really interesting elements to offer in terms of their ability to do that from, for years and years of environmental adaptation in what's gone on there. Lamb survival is a huge one from a carbon footprint, obviously, because if we put um, lots of resource into the into the ewe to actually have lambs, then having a big dead pile of lambs is bad news for us, not just in terms of economics, but also um, uh, environment and also for, for you in terms of your morale. And <laughs> there's nothing worse than things like abortion storms or or, or stormy weather and having lots of dead lambs. So again, we work very carefully to make sure that the lamb survival in our meat breeds is being improved year on year. And ironically, we improve that by recording accurately dead lambs. It's actually the dead lambs, the data we capture on the dead lambs, when they die, what they've died of, that is giving us the ability to actually create quite robust breeding values and predictors for lamb survival, probably much higher than what's been reported in the industry historically um, within all of that. And we will in the DNA recorded flocks, if there's a, a, if there's a spurious lamb found in the field on the morning of a lambing run, we will actually DNA profile that as well um, to see what's going on with it so that we can actually um, understand who parents are within all of that. So again, lamb loss is a huge one and we place quite a substantial amount of our, our efforts you're making sure that these sheep are easy lambing and very quick to their feet um, and their ability to actually stay alive. Because a growth EBV or a muscle EBV is pretty redundant if the thing isn't breathing. So crucially important to get live lambs on the ground. Um, the other one from, a, from an environmental footprint, obviously, is your longevity. So, um, you know, replacement rates has a huge impact. If we can actually keep our replacement rates towards the 20% or less, as opposed to some flocks that are 25, 30%. And that high replacement rate can be caused by a number of things, not least disease, well, iceberg diseases, eating away without actually understanding what's going on with them. It can be breeding. It can be all sorts of things that can impact that. But we know there is a, there is a genetic uh, heritability to it. And um, we have a productive life breeding value by, again, by recording the reasons of culling from our breeding flocks we can again understand which lines, which animals are able to give us productive life of, of five, six seasons, which obviously is what we want as opposed to two or three or four. So again, having that productive life element is really important in terms of the footprint of those animals because the biggest attrition you'll find in your flock at any one stage is when you've lambed your two tooth ewes for the first time and they're going to second crop ewes. If you have a look at your, your matrixes, you'll find that's where the huge losses are happening on your farm. Once they get to the second, third, fourth crops, they're actually coasting quite nicely. And if we can actually get, you know, four or five or six 
productive years and I stay productive, not just the fact that they're there like hack racks, but actually that they're producing and performing for you, then it's a win-win to your pocket and it's very much a win-win to the environment. So a really important one. And as I've said, that condition score one, we've got a really strong heritability on condition score. So in other words, there is a genetic component to how a daughter of a ram or a daughter of a you or, or son will actually hold condition. Um, it's not all environment. There is a genetic component, which means that we can actually breed for sheep that hold their flesh easier and, and keep through our system. And you'd be no surprise to you that with most of our lines, if not all, we don't penalize fat. We actually um, are very tolerant on fat levels in our sheep. We, we select for, lean, for, for growth rate um, on a carcass level for more muscle, but we don't have negative weightings on fat. Because again, with forage-based systems, not only do we need that ability for a sheep to finish, but we also need the flexibility where if you have to offload animals into the store market, for example, that they have a good touch to them so that they actually add value um, when you're selling them in that way. So it's not all, it, sometimes we have to have elements of, of phenotype and aesthetics in there when we farm. And that's really quite an important component really in what we do. And I'm just going to finish because I'm conscious of time, Nikki. We've got um, just on the carbon element, which is obviously um, a big hot topic these days. Um, obviously, we're all talking about um, methane. Um, and within the sheep elements, we know that you know there is quite a big variation. We know that most of the, the carbon footprint of sheep farms is attributed to the methane emissions um, as opposed to um, the other elements of the farming operation. And we know that lots, there are lots of mitigating elements that you can have from a systems point of view in there. Um, and we know that, you know, that higher technical efficiency, that the more, the optimum weight of the ewe, her, her lambing percentage, the live lambs, the longevity, those are the technical efficiencies that have a huge impact at your carbon footprint within your flock. Um, but equally important, there is quite a big variation between individual sheep from within any breed. If they eat the same feed, the same type of feed, um, in terms of how much methane uh, they're producing. And quite a lot of the work that, that's gone on in New Zealand, who are now into their third year this year with it. And you'll some of you that are in Ireland will know that, that Tregas and, and uh, Sheep Island have been doing some work probably into the second, coming to third year with it now. Um, it's becoming quite quite um, instrumental into what we do. So we we as Innovis have a, a pack chambers, these portable accumulation chambers um, built. They should be with us hopefully in May. They're, they're built in New Zealand, um, and we will start gradually doing uh, measurements on our breed lines so that we can not just drive productive efficiency at farm level, that we can also directly reduce methane measurements. Um, uh, uh, output by breeding sheep that will produce less methane. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot, it's a complex area and there's lots of, of pitfalls in all of this. And there could be a heap of sort of consequences that, that are negative. So we have got a farming innovation program application and currently with Defra and Innovate to enable us to actually much, go much quicker with this, to actually do much quicker recording, to do much bigger numbers. Um, and also to look at, at the interactions with things like rumen size. So, for example, there is a very strong relationship between rumen volume and reduced methane. But we know as, as grazing animals in the UK that we don't really want to reduce the rumen too much. Otherwise, they may not be able to actually do what we need them to do on these hill paddocks and these hill farms. So there are some quite important interactions there. And equally important is the rumen microbiome and how that changes. So lots of things we don't know. And although we're connected very closely to the scientific groups, both over here and globally, um, we are trying to move in a, in a stepped way with this so that we don't have um, unintended um, consequences with some of this um, that could actually come in and hurt what we're trying to do, obviously, to the benefit of people. And Nikki, that's probably enough for me talking. I'm sure people will have some questions that they may like to ask. That's brilliant, Derry. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, it was really, really great to hear um, 
so much of the uh, yeah remind myself of some of the things that I was really impressed with when I when I came to visit the farm um and I think the key thing that I really got from that was you were talking about um you know the land that runs the sheep and really putting you know thinking about what land have I got what have, what's my resource base and how do I match the right sheep to that rather than thinking I'm going to buy these particular sheep in and oh god now I've got to do all this work to try and to meet them halfway um and also that thing about trusting the breeder and knowing their system rather than just looking at the numbers actually kind of understanding that broader system context so really really good to hear hear about those things um we have got a question that's come in from ned so um hopefully there'll be other questions coming into the chat so folks please do um use the chat to get your questions in but um ned was reflecting on the unintended unintended consequences that you were talking about so he said could you give some other examples that you've encountered for instance does the low dag score mean losing other desirable traits or have there been other kind of trade-offs that you found when looking at looking at some of that uh, single trait selection yeah sure of course um you know the main one that people face quite often is is increasing the size of their sheep because by selecting for faster growth rate in our animals we make them bigger so again by just recording growth rate the weight of a lamb for example when it's being muscle backward scanned um without actually doing those mature weights on the females um on an ongoing basis quite what happens quite often is that the growth rate goes up and pretty much every time in parallel the size of the animal will go up with it so that's obviously quite a big one when it comes to maternal sheep, because the last thing you want is a sheep that becomes 10 kilos heavier on your farm when it can't really cope or your system doesn't really want that. So that's a very easy one, quite often is the case. You'll see certain traits. Um, for example, we have a um, we have a differentiated product line with Waitrose, with, with, with Pilgrims that it, it's selected for improved eating quality, has more intramuscular fat in the animal. Um, so if you go to Waitrose and you look for Waitrose 1 lamb in top shelf, you'll actually see Dorset lamb um, this time of year. And then in May, it'll transition to Abervale, which is one of our sort of ram breeds that we, we supply all the way through then till January the following year, or the farmers do. Now, if we were to go just for muscle density and, and intramuscular fat in that instance, what we would find is that we would actually lose out killing out percentage by about 4%. So again, although it's better eating um, and it gives that waitress consumer consistency and, and hopefully, you know, that the, what they paid for, that we the farm and the producer would be losing out effectively in terms of the dressing of those carcasses. So in that instance, what we do is we actually supply rams into that supply chain that actually are under a certain threshold when it comes to, to muscle density marbling effectively as a proxy measure but we also make sure that the performance criteria is also over a certain level so that there's no compromise effectively in terms of the killing out percentage and there's quite a few of those obviously you know the strength of the heritability of the trait is is normally the determining factor as is the correlation with the other traits the wool traits you know our, our skins if you like the, the wool on the sheep is probably the, the highest heritability when it comes to, to to breeding which is why if you use a, a sheep with a, what people would call a, a, a bad skin it actually has lambs that actually has quite a big impact on that um, some of the traits that are very difficult to improve on for example is our, our prolificacy traits you know uh, our prolificacy heritability is about 0.1 so 10 percent of the variation is due to the genetics of the animal all these other things have an impact on that so a positive impact for example, is that we select animals and we condition score in our breeding program three or four times a year, and we build a breeding value for condition score. Now, by actually having a condition score breeding value, we find that the heritability of that trait is closer to 24, 25%, which means that we can have a much bigger influence through breeding. So if we can breed animals using the condition score breeding value, to breed sheep that will always have better condition, those animals will hit that three and a half conditions for tupping time and will always scan higher than the sheep that aren't being able to do that. So if we, if we go directly for prolificacy, which is about 10%, number of lambs um, 
weaned is even lower, about four or five percent in it in its heritability, because lots more of the management noises go in there. As opposed to if we select sheep for their ability to hold condition, we will get to the end point of actually maintaining our, our lambing percentage much quicker because we have a trait and condition score that is more heritable that actually gives that, that animal the ability to be in the optimum condition at tupping time to give you the optimum result. So it works in lots of different ways. Sometimes there's a positive association. And sometimes you, you cut across that because obviously we're very much a commercial business and quite a lean one of that. So we don't really have too much. Everybody run in our business. There's not too many people that walk. Um, Jenna knows that she's worked in the past with us. Um, and as a consequence, we have to find quick ways through some of this um, in, in terms of getting to the end point, really. Hopefully that helps answer some of that for you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, there's a question from Penn. Um, Penn, you're welcome to unmute if you want to, to ask the question. Uh, thanks, thanks, Nikki. No, it, it was just really, you know, there's all this, these questions on um, uh, how the environment and early life experience, including what goes on in utero, uh, and also the rumen microbiome and what they eat early on and how they learn and all those questions can have a long term effect in, in epigenetic modification uh, uh, with, with non genomic changes. So, so do, do those, and because you're presenting them out of, and, and selecting for rams across the country, I, are you seeing any effect of that that, that might skew, skew your results? Sure. The, 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 the simple answer, Hen, is that I don't know in the fact that the whole epigenetics and what happens um, in nutritional pressures and all sorts of associations, there is a huge amount that we don't know that influences what goes on. Um, we've seen lots of work that shows, you know, and there was quite a lot of blackie work done many years ago that showed if you were if you actually had nutritional stresses at certain times, it would have quite a big impact. And I suppose all of those elements, there's a physiological one sometimes, you know, some of that John Robinson stuff with Suffolk's that if you overfed mm -hmm. and placental development had a direct impact, but obviously at, at embryo level becomes even more complex. So we haven't got the sophistication or the technology to be able to disentangle that currently. What we would hope is that because we're recording animals within certain time points but also through their lifetime performance and all of their relatives through their lifetime performance on these systems that we're picking up as much variation and noise as we can currently but i can for a minute tell you that that one animal that's been influenced <laughs> at an epigenetic level won't be different to the other um, as, as a blunt instrument what we do currently works we can predict with relative accuracy what happens um but that doesn't always um come through um when, when we go into the finer detail of stuff and and do, do you find then the 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 people might or, or or are you starting to find that people who who have very different systems from what you are if they buy buy stock from you by breeding rams from you they they I'm not, I'm, i mean i'm sure you'll you'll work very well on systems that you 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 know your hill systems but if they they take them to the wrong system if you like you know, what those early life experiences are so important for what happens later on, at least, I, 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 you know. Um, Certainly, yeah. Well, what, what we find currently is that it, it sort of works the wrong way in some ways. So, for example, I'll give you our experience when we were trying to put some of these breeds together. When we were putting, for example, our um, terminal sires together, one of the terminal sires was a composite ram that had Charolais and Texels put into it. Yeah. Now, we selected some of the highest performance signet recorded animals we could just because of our background and also from flocks that were run very commercially in terms of putting those animals together for the initial mix but we find that the ranking and the performance of those animals changes completely when we use them in our system so a top one percent charolais of texel for example recorded in a slightly more traditional system that has, uh, you know, a, a slightly maybe less pressure put on it, less population density, slightly more concentrate feed going in there. 
its performance won't translate into being a top 1% animal or its progeny within our evaluations. Um, and I dare I say, probably some of our sheep, um, if they're bought, you know, you could have the same composite terminal sire being used in a very high input farm where you actually won't see any benefit whatsoever from it because of, of what's going on in that system. Now, some of that I think is probably um, rumen development or rather than the, the sort of the microbe development in there because there's lots we influence at an early stage. Um, and I think, you know, we, we really do put sheep um, under the cosh when people go to marts. Well, first of all, when people go to auction marts and they will only look at the sheep for its phenotype and its size and power, and then they expect that sheep to come home and run with um, a low input system because obviously, you know, it's been pushed to get to that level and, and it won't translate across because of all sorts of reasons. So we are seeing different performances um, in terms of, of what we can pretty much be sure about is that there is a there is a recording element in our sheep up to that sort of 16, 20 week period on the on everything. The females that are retained within the breeding program are getting lifetime evaluations across the different systems, and that all feeds back in to us. Um, but but what we are finding as well is how animals are then grown out through their winter months into sale time also has quite a big influence on their performance. So in other words, these rams that are under constant challenge against each other in groups of 100 or 200, um, having to work with forage crops, having to work with deferred grazing, still being balanced with nutrients that they need, but having to forage, if you like, for their living, quite often will be bought by a farmer, will go out and will mate a fairly big number of ewes, 70, 80, 100 ewes in that first 17 day cycle, unless they're running over 5,000 acres to chase the sheep down and will hold their condition and will continue to do so every year going forward. Um, so we're finding that having that selection across forage based systems and having growing these rams out in, a, in, a, in another forage based system, which can differ from, for example, we might have rams in Pembrokeshire that are on grass through winter, we might have other rams that are on um, root crops. But nevertheless, the constant is they're always behind electric fence, they're always competing with each other in fairly big groups. And we're always fairly harsh in terms of any animals that aren't keeping up with that we're selecting. So to give you an example, we will put last year, we put 3,200 ram lambs into winter. And that's 3,200 ram lambs out of probably about seven or 8,000 ram lambs that had been born. And of those that actually made it through uh, the winter, the following year into sale had dropped to about 2,200. So there is selection pressure being put on at all of those stages so that when somebody buys them, they've effectively done quite a lot to get to that stage. Um, now, there's probably lots of, of interesting biology in all of that, but we don't know it. So we're currently working on the outcomes and how they perform for people. And and the what, sorry, sorry, can I carry on, Nikki? And the ones that don't do well, if I'd said no, Pen, would you stop now? I'm only joking. Carry on. Carry on. <laughs> what, what, they, the ones that don't do well, how do you ensure that their welfare is 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 fine before they you send them away? I mean, oh, we, we 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 look at these rams quite regularly. So we've got a team down today, for example, down in Bath, um, going through rams. They come over the conveyor. Um, they get turned over. We look at foot structures. We look at what's going on. We look at weight gain, and anything that's falling behind gets pulled out. So we, we don't leave them, you know, until they're em emancipated by a fence somewhere. When we start seeing animals starting to not perform, we're actually pulling them out and actually putting them into the supply chain, into, 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 the, into the works. So we're, we're very conscious. And likewise with ewes, really, in the system, we will quite often see sheep that just aren't performing. Um, and we will quite simply let them carry through their lambs um, and we will just cull them when it comes to sort of mating time the following year. So there's quite a lot of attrition that goes on within our flocks, but it's it's controlled and it's very closely monitored because we try and operate to a very high standard of welfare wherever we can. Um, 
I, and one one final bit, and then I'll shut up, Nikki. So so about methane, methane has a has a functional significance, you, you know, in terms of like making sure that the animal doesn't have too much hydrogen in its belly, yeah. for want of a better way of putting it. So what is your honest opinion about this push of trying to get ruminants to have less methane? I mean, you know, environment aside, but from the welfare and, and well-being of the animal. Well, all the work so far from the gas to gas projects is showing that there's a reduction in rumen size. So although there's a room, although there's a methane reduction, I think if you like the rumen component is also smaller as a consequence. So I suspect as a ratio, it probably isn't that different to what it would be. You've got a smaller rumen, less population, less methane coming out. And, and are you finding that those animals are doing just as well on well, your grass-based system? Well, that's the the question we don't know. And no, I'm not convinced about that currently because all of the the work has been done so far has been done on grass pellets indoors. And that's not really what we breed and farm. So we are quite concerned about going too quickly down this route just on methane reduction without understanding the association with rumen and the association with metabolism and grazing behavior and overall performance. So I'd be very, very worried about reducing the gut in our Highlanders and our Chiviots, for example, to create a smaller room and that produces less methane because I think there could be some other uh, consequences there. So I think it needs a stepped, careful approach and not to get too carried away too quickly with it. Okay, Thanks. thank you very much. I'll shut up now. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. You can come in again in a minute if you need to. But, um, Demi, that was really interesting, actually, about the room and size. I would be very worried um, as somebody who's, you know, working with these grass-based systems, everything that we want has got a big room in. You know, yeah, I'm talking about cattle, but, you know, that's that's the thing that's kind of going to let the animal um, be as efficient as it possibly can be on, on a forage system. So, yeah, that would definitely be worrying. So it's making what you say about that step change makes sense. Um, I'm going to... Jump to our next question. So Gala asks a brilliant question relating to resistance resilience. And she says, are you aiming for sheep that tolerate high worm burdens or are you looking for sheep that are picking up less worms? Okay, our current selection works on reducing the worm burden onto the farm. So in other words, we're selecting for sheep that have reduced fecal output, but still grow, yeah? So in other words, reducing the challenge to the lambs. Now, I know it's a hot topic. We have started not just doing fecal egg counts. Um, individual, well, we've been doing individual fecal egg counts for quite a few years. So we, we, we use mob counts for all our management practices anyway. So we don't drench just for the hell of it. It's always done based on a mob count. Um, although we do find that even some of that technology can be quite flawed, that there can be some animals that really are struggling if the mob count is at a certain level. So there always has to be you know, a, a, an injection of common sense in all of that. Um, and obviously when people start talking about targeted drenching, it, it, it again, it, it opens up a whole host of things from a breeding point of view, it becomes quite difficult because you need lots of different management groups then in terms of how you're dealing with the data. So we try not to target wrench where we can. We try and go on mob counts at a, at a farm level or, or a group level. And then once we get thresholds that are high enough, normally about, well, our target would be five, 600, but quite often this year, I think our, our um, egg counts were closer to 900 or 950 when we went in and did individuals. We are doing IgA blood samples at the same time and doing serum IgA on them to see what the immune response of those animals is. Um, but currently our selection is on reducing the worm burden while still growing, not working with high thresholds, rightly or wrongly, that's where we are currently. Um, and I know there's other groups, you know, Exlanas, various others, Cleans, <coughs> that are very into this. Um, so, yeah, I think there's lots of opposing views here. Obviously, yeah. you know, the, the grazing management seems to have quite a big impact, doesn't it, in terms of if we're using lenient grazing, proper regen pastures, that's going to change the dynamic of how that animal is, is foraging. You know, so, so I think there's, there's lots of things to take into account. 
Yeah, there's some interesting research that's happening in Scotland at the moment that's looking at exactly that kind of trying to um, compare different grazing management systems, because I think at the moment there's been grazing management systems and how that relates in sheep to worm burden, but then they haven't necessarily all been compared in one big study. So I think that that's something that Safari team are trying to do through um, the Morden Institute. So that'll be interesting to see the outcomes of that over the next couple of years. Um, question from another question from Ned, um, who says, do you think culling out the lowest performers is the quickest way to improve overall performance of the flock? And I'm sure you're going to say, and also buying an Innovis Ram, but <laughs> in the first instance, yeah. no, no, <laughs> is so it I, about, you know, when, when it comes to commercial flocks, we always recommend commercial customers, cull your repeat offenders and buy stock that's been selected for the traits that you need in your flock. Yeah. And Quite often, you know, the low hanging fruit on those repeat offenders will be lameness, you know, so never shall we treat an animal twice and never shall we foot trim um, unless you've got really severe cod infection and you isolate and you need to do some remedial stuff for, before they cull. But generally speaking, you know, we stop trimming feet and we start instigating a culling policy where sheep are, are lame. And, and, you know, we have quite smart ways of doing that sometimes, you know, because we operate quite big groups of sheep and we don't have a lot of time. So, you know, if we're bringing sheep into the yards, for example, quite often what we'll do is that we'll, we'll actually take them the long way around. And as they're coming into the yard, we'll flick the gate for the last third that are coming in. And if there's any lame issues, they're the sheep for you to actually concentrate on. So the first two thirds of the flock are probably absolutely fine. It can be dealt with and out the way. But isolation then for those, so, so certainly lameness is, a, is, a, is one. What we call, you know, wet dries. So in other words, sheep that are scanned in lamb, but everybody's tired at the end of lambing. You don't really care too much what's left. And there might be some sheep prancing around the fields with no lambs about with them. Um, and again, when we look at the footprint of that animal, it really needs to be producing something to, to justify being there. There's some, you know, quite similar to some of the suckle cow systems about the place. There's some horrific, you know, uh, calving uh, outputs in some of them. <clears throat> so same with the sheep. So in other words, the, the wet dries and and obviously, you know, things like have low hanging teats, ewes that don't stick with their lambs that can count twins if you have if you are running that sort of system. <clears throat> All of those elements, bearing in mind that you have to give what's gone on due thought and process. You know, so for example, if you go and lamb a ewe too early and you disrupt her, especially if she's a young ewe, then probably the issue there is man or woman made as opposed to the sheep itself. So I think common sense has to prevail there. But by far the quickest element is if you can get rid of those bottom 10, 20% of the flock in terms of, of your repeat offenders. If you are sophisticated or have enough time <coughs> to actually do weight, to actually have lambs linked to their mothers and you've got a proper estimation of what's yielding you uh, results at farm level then that's hugely powerful and you can actually make some quite big inroads there um elements you know from a from a from a farming point of view from from a management point of view we always recommend that young ewes go to a terminal sire an easy lambing terminal sire so that they spend at least two or three years in the flock before they're actually determined whether they should be going to the maternal ram to be kept. And the beauty of that as well is it gives you a bit more space before daughters of rams come back to their father. So you actually don't have to buy quite as many rams in terms of maternal rams. So we always recommend terminal sire for the first two or three years, an easy lambing one, and then into the maternal group if they haven't upset you in that process. Um, and then obviously that goes exactly the same for the genetics element. <clears throat> we have the added benefit that we have a, a selection index. And not only can we actually take out offenders based on functional things, we can also look at the index of a flock and actually say, right, anything below 50% below average goes. So that enables us to really try and move quicker on some of these traits. Bearing in mind that some of the traits, especially some of the maternal traits, do take quite a while to come through. So a maternal trait isn't really very robust until you've had four years of recording. Um, so really, you know, when you've actually got that information on how daughters, sons, relatives are performing, 
that's when those breeding values and those traits are really coming through properly. And again, we always say to people, you know, be wary of the maternal ram you buy because you're going to live with that decision for the next 10 years. Um, they're going to actually see your children grow up and they're actually going to see you get grey hairs. Um, or not, if it's the right choice, obviously. <laughs> Now, Ned's going to test my Welsh because he's written his response in Welsh. Um, <laughs> so I think I'm going to let you read that one, Derry, because I haven't spoken Welsh for a while. But he's yeah, basically he, saying... He more says it's a lot of nonsense. And no, it, it, it's very interesting. So. <laughs> um, that's really helpful. Um, and yeah, I don't think we've got any other questions that are coming up. If there's anyone else who wants to unmute and ask a question. One point, I suppose, Nick, I think it's important to remember is that we always get 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 questions sometimes. Can these composite or improved sheep actually do the job of what a you know a, a native bred animal in its environment would do? And the simple answer, I think, with all of this is that it depends what you want the sheep to do, and it depends what sort of what system you want to run with it. Most of the time, we can actually get our sheep to outperform the majority of what's there, um, which sounds quite bizarre, doesn't it, when you think something is acclimatized for a long time in that environment. But that's because, you know, there's quite a, a high selection pressure being put on them. And I always suggest to people sometimes, if you can work within the breed, then that's great. If you haven't got the options, within the breed for that improvement, then put something like this in, but cross back into your breed again. So in other words, inject something in, but then back cross into what you want. You know, it, it does no harm for that one generation um, to bring it back in and quite often will open up a genetic base uh, in terms of doing that. Um, and that's, you know, shouldn't be seen as plagiarizing, although I'm sure some people are, are probably spitting their tea out at such a concept. Um, but but we have to move quickly towards some of these elements, really. Yeah, you're right. And we have to remember that there's been hundreds of years of kind of playing around with these breeds before they got to where they are now. And uh, if we become kind of, again, you know, people might get might not like this approach, but if we come, become too precious about the kind of the breed, and I think, um, you know, what's that? that kind of bit of trivia that there's more genetic variation within than between breeds and actually managing for selecting for type and putting that selection pressure on that is right for your system and that fits your farm objectives and your holistic goals is going to be the way that you make the most progress and you know that you're the most profitable and sustainable um, and I know that there was some really interesting research that um, you know Russell Williams who you'll know well from Aberystwyth was doing and I remember him saying that they were looking at the different um, for sheep systems in Wales and they were looking at the different carbon footprint and actually if everybody shifted to where the top 20% were or 10% were then it would meet all of the um, climate targets set for agriculture in Wales and that was simply through more efficient approaches to selection it was more you know looking at um looking at that data managing for those outcomes that were that were required rather than kind of just keeping everything and and treating lots of issues rather than um yeah. selecting out those problems so yeah. Yeah. I, I suppose Nikki, it is probably yeah. worth noting that for example in our trivia program we do buy and recorded rams to come in purely because we can't get anything else and just because they're unrecorded doesn't always mean to say that they're actually not going to perform. In fact, the last rams we bought from, from a very good farm up north are performing really well and are actually starting to come through in the, to the top 25% of the breed in our population. Um, but I suppose the crucial thing is not only do we know how they're performing, but we're also seeing, because we do quite a lot of genomic work on them, you know, we're also seeing that one of the rams, for example, carried, carried a copy of yellow fat, which we don't particularly want in some of the abattoirs. Um, one was a VRQ, which is quite a, which is, you know, so so there's quite elements in there in the industry where we have lots of other things that, so there's plenty of sheep out there, I think, but they just need to be evaluated in a sensible way so that we can make objective decisions. Um, and then obviously the other one that, that absolutely decimates most of our system, but we're unaware of it, is disease. We're way too laxadaisy with our biosecurity in the sheep sector in general. Um, in fact, we've got a webinar next Thursday, an Innovis one on icebergs and just biosecurity in general. And 
And um, again, you know, when you look at the cost of worms and nematodes in terms of carbon, and when you look at the cost when it comes to some iceberg diseases, you know, hammering MTUs, increasing lamb losses, they're, they're really substantial things. Um, and it always amazes me that the VI centers in the UK from now until April will be full of dead lambs when we've got quite effective vaccines out there that can be used. We're still seeing lots of abortions about the place. Um, so I think, you know, from an animal welfare and, and, and sort of health elements, we probably just need to be a little bit more vigilant in how we operate um, across the board, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's that's a really, really good point. And it's something that, you know, is the uh, I don't know if we've got any uh, folk on the call in Scotland, but as the agriculture policy changes here, there's much more focus on on health and on how on, on attaching uh, conditionality to subsidy that relates to um, much stricter health monitoring on, on farm to try and address some of those issues. Um, we have had a question from Cathy who says, what would you change if you were going to start again from scratch? What a good question. Oh God! Oh, <laughs> um, oh um, it. I suppose it's been very, very difficult. Our sheep breeding operation, um, far, far more difficult than we expected it to be. I think partly because um, sheep can die. Sheep will have bad pastures. Sheep just won't do what you expect them to do. So as a as a biological animal to work with, you can see why the genuses of this world haven't gone into sheep, because they're a, they're a slow generation interval. Um, they're, they're, they're not the most proficient animal in the world. So, so yeah, we, we've we've spent a lot of time trying to um, find solutions. We now have a, what we would classify as a toolkit approach, which is you know a few different breeds. We're always conscious not to make that too complex, otherwise it becomes too much of a sort of takeaway menu. Um, but I suppose knowing what we know now, we probably um, we probably would have started with slightly less um, breeding partners, spent a bit more time actually doing quite a bit of homework on production systems within all of those. Um, We've learned quite a lot on our modeling and our forecasting <laughs> that rarely come through. Um, so you have to use a matrix on, on what you put, produce, which is much different to what we started with. So I think, you know, we've got a realization now that we didn't before, naivety probably before, would suggest that if you breed this, you will end up with this, whereas actually you've got all of that in between. So I think if we did it again, God forbid, we would be far more realistic. We would be far more pragmatic in our projections. Um, would we change any of the breeds we're working with? Um, probably not because we've sort of evolved them into where they are now. Um, we probably would have used some of the New Zealand genetics sooner into some of the British breeds to help with functionality. But then equally important, we've then made sure that they've gone back into the sort of the mix of what we had so that we still have a phenotype. Um, we've learned that sheep can't be sold unless they look the part to farmers. So in other words, you know, it doesn't matter if you have the best figured sheep in the world, if it looks like a goat, it won't be sold. Yeah. So they have to be culled on phenotype or structure, whatever you want to call it, equally important to anything else. And we've learned that a bad story is 10 times more potent than a good one um, within all of that. So you have to manage those elements. And I think we've also learned not to put sheep in a system that is not designed for those sheep. So I think you have to have the willingness to be able to say, look, we don't think this is going to work here. This might, you might actually be better going to Joe Blogs down the road for something else that will fit your system slightly better. Um, I think we would have gone onto the shedding lines slightly sooner than we have, because I think we've been slow on the take there. I think there's there's a huge momentum. Um, we have lots of exciting things to do with wool. We, we are going to work with the wool board. We are going to work on Micron. We are going to try and start building brand value with wool. And we are going to try and reduce the Micron of some of our lines and actually improve the quality, because I think there are step changes in wool prices 
that we can do with, without too much work. And because it's such a strong heritable trait, it can be done. Um, as an industry, we probably need to learn to handle wool better in terms of not shearing full sheep on dirty boards, being willing to do some skirting on the wool to actually improve what we're producing. So instead of moaning that wool prices are poor, be slightly more proactive to, in terms of the breeding and in how we actually prepare it. And likewise, providing solutions to people that just don't want wool on their lines of sheep. Um, so there are heaps of lessons we've learned. Um, would we do it again? Probably, because um, no other bugger would, would they? So unless we do it. And I suppose one of the big elements of what we're about as well is that we are instigating change, not people buying in of its genetics, because there's some people do and some people that won't, but it's also hopefully spurring on the industry to do things slightly differently and to take some of this stuff slightly more seriously so that, that you know, hopefully it actually... I won't say wakes up some breeds, but it certainly makes people think that breed societies need development plans and they need to be structured for the right reasons to, to actually fit the marketplace. Um, you know, we still have a huge sector in the UK that is not geared towards sheep farming, that is geared towards producing very nice looking sheep for each other. Um, and the individuals that do that, I know fools, they're very astute businessmen and women that, that are doing it for, for their reasons. Um, but I think um, what needs to happen, I suppose, is that commercial farmers out there need to learn that there's more to sheep than just the look of that animal through the ring and that they have to do much more work to get to the bottom of what the breed is doing and to align. So, yeah, lots of, of, of elements we've learned as well, I suppose, in terms of communicating with people that there's no point talking to farmers about breeding values. You need to talk to farmers about what their goals are for the flock, what they want to achieve, what needs to change. And quite often that discussion will take you on a whole tangent where if you actually get the family members and workers around the table and discuss what's the plan for the flock, quite often they've not had time to discuss it themselves. So in that you know, in that hour or piece of paper, you'll end up with some outcomes that you think, well, actually, that's quite different. Granddad wants to not do as much, wants to have a, a house in the village. <laughs> or this child just really doesn't want to be doing what they're doing. So quite often you, you end up in a, in a conclusion that's slightly different to where you were. But once you know that, we can create a strategy and a plan towards getting there. Um, and if there's one thing for certain, we have to not keep sheep that are taking too much time and work. You know, it doesn't have to be this labor of love that people have continually. You know, we can look after bigger numbers. We can look after healthier sheep um, just by actually being more strategic in how we go about breeding and farming them, I think. Um, and everything becomes far more enjoyable then because we start talking about measuring grass and, and getting nutrition right to get the you in the right condition for lambing outdoors and all of the things actually that make sheep farming quite sexy again, not the drudgery of crutching and trimming feet and all of that that's such a good point isn't it and coming back to that social element I think I find that kind of you know being involved in some of the monitor farm conversations that you start talking about cows and actually what you end up talking about is what dad wants to do and you know how mum wants to be more involved with the farm and cousin over there wants to get involved and actually it's all that stuff that's kind of maybe limiting the farm from from really optimizing its potential not really what animals you've got in the shed or in the field so um yeah that's always it always seems to come back to that um we've got a couple more questions they are trickling in um so Stephen wants to know um what do you think the national sheep breeding structure will look like in 25 years time goodness that's a question isn't it um we need a whole other webinar for that one, I think, but yeah, give it a go. A one because <laughs> I, I think the disconnection that's currently there is probably the biggest problem <laughs> because as farmers, I think I think there's, there are two elements, isn't there? There's, there, isn't, there isn't clarity, I think, in terms of policy when it comes to how are we actually going to farm <laughs> into the future, how we're going to balance environment and, and production. So there needs to be quite a lot of work done on, on, on creating a clear plan for that. And, you know, because we have all the devolved bodies, it's not just one discussion and one piece of work. It's four or five, isn't it, in terms of getting that? Um, and, and I think this disconnection from what is pedigree to the commercial sector, we probably need to bridge that somehow a bit more than it is. Um, 
I would be optimistically saying that there's going to be more change. I think there is already change in the fact that I think one of the big step changes we've seen so far in the UK is the use of grass and, and utilisation. You know, go back five years and certainly 10 years, there wouldn't be the, anywhere the number of people that actually do rotational grazing that actually have these approaches. So I think that in some ways is probably the, the catalyst that then says, well, when we start looking at those sorts of systems, we then need to start looking at how we breed our sheep to fit in those systems. So I would predict that even in 10 years, the industry will look slightly differently to where it is now and it'll be much more commercially focused. We probably in 10 years will still have the, the, the top end, or I would say top end, the, 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 the pedigree breeding sector for itself, but hopefully there'll be a little bit more association down from it. Um, and in terms of breeds, I hope all the breed societies are here because I think it's actually quite a, a colorful part of our heritage. So we just need to help, I think, some of the breed societies to make sure that, that they stay relevant and current with what's going on um, because there is space for everybody, you know, within it all. Um, in terms of supply chain, I think, you know, these trade deals that our beloved government have signed are a bloody disaster. Um, and the New Zealand and Australian imports could have quite a big um, element. And that's, I suppose, why we're really trying to disentangle me measuring methane and its consequences, because we are going to be competing, not just globally, but on the whole market here, about with carbon neutral lamb coming from other countries, based on the same principles, rightly or wrongly. So that's why we're moving on, you know, because it's not a very nice thing to order a pack chambers out of New Zealand because they're quite expensive. But I know for us to be able to compete and for us to be able to have our customers compete, we have to go on this journey, but we have to be very careful that we, we don't do something that is actually going to give us more issues down the line. But we have to compete within all of that. And I think these trade deals will bite. Um, so we have to do everything better. We have to talk about what we do because, you know, UK farming is actually very good, personally. Um, we just need to tell people slightly more what goes on with it. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a couple of minutes left. So I'm going to bring the, the last two questions together. So one is, what selection are you doing to reduce the risk of fly strike? And then Halcyon asks, given how many lamb losses are down to worm burden, do you think you'll have an increased demand specifically for your low feck rams and groups going forward? Okay. Um, well, I'll, uh, yeah. So, so um, sorry, what was the first one again, Nikki? Uh, it was about selection to reduce the risk of fly strike. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. So we've been doing breach scoring now for a while on um, around the back end of sheep as we do dag scoring, which are so, two sort of different traits. We do think that there is a genetic component to fly strike in general. So over the shoulder, for example, or on the side. So we record what gets struck. We haven't got a big enough database yet to be able to do anything with that. Um, so we're not quite sure where that will go. And um, we have a line of sheep that is that is being developed to be hair stroke shedding, um, obviously, which which doesn't necessarily remove the risk, but will hopefully have an impact on it. Um, so we've got work underway in both of those, um, more on the back end than the rest of the carcass of the animal. But um, we are recording all the other traits within all of that. Um, in terms of, of FEC reduction, yes, that's becoming more and more important. And I think if a farming business truly understands the cost of the, of the, of the of opportunity cost that they're losing from parasites, then FEC becomes much more important to people <clears throat> because um, in lots, most farms, there is there are losses incurring in production every day or every week from nematode challenges that are just unaware of, or there is equally, you know, overuse of products in the wrong way or under drenching and all sorts of things of, of, of mismanagement. So I think it is becoming a much, much bigger um, component. Um, what I'm not quite sure about is as we change our farming systems, which is happening, you know, from cell grazing rotationally, moving every three days on a normal rotation to lenient grazing where we're trampling, to deferred grazing through winter, 
um, to changing climate where we get homunculus coming in bizarre times of the year. There's lots of dynamics changing around us as well. So whilst we have the, the sheep as of the biological element, I suppose that we can work with, we have to try and stay current with what's happening around us. Currently, we're doing our FEC assessments, if you like, based on rotational systems, based on what would be you know, normal grazing heights. We're not really evaluating um, tall swords, which could give us a slightly different picture. But yeah, I think there's an, a growing uh, requirement to have that built into the selection for people. And I think it'll be quite important. Brilliant. There we thank you so much. We're going to stop there. We've just run over. Um, massive thank you um, to you for coming along and sharing all of that insight and that knowledge. Um, and I think folk can find Inverse online, as you said earlier, all across social media, if you're interested in learning more. Um, we also did open this publicly. So not everyone who's here is a Pasture for Life member. Really recommend looking into membership. You don't have to be 100% pasture fed certified to be a member. You can just be a member. Um, there is a charge. It's £100 a year, um, but you get to join in with lots of other webinars um, that are not just publicly available that are only open to members and take part in a lot of our regional activities study tours um, and also have access to the forum so it's a really great value um, membership offer um, but yeah thanks again Derry and thanks everyone for coming along this evening and asking some brilliant questions and the recording will be available on the Pasture for Life YouTube channel and um, we can make sure that that's linked through to your social media as well Derry. Thank right. you everybody. For Thank you so much. <laughs> Good night. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.